even if it just flows through the server, it has to be hashed and encrypted. It's very strict. And I looked at having to do this with AIG for a year and a half, and the technology teams just could not wrap their heads around the security necessary for it. And、yeah. so we stayed with Chase, and Chase gave it all to us in an iframe. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people. Processes and technologies. So, if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey, everyone! Welcome back to another episode. Of the WBS podcast, I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at Independent ERP and Digital Transformation Consulting Firm, Elevate IQ. How hard could choosing a payment provider be, and what could go wrong with e-commerce integrations? Well, if you don't understand how to integrate them, you could be logged out of your account. You might not be able to access your funds for the products you may have sold, and that all might be necessary. If you want to protect yourself from fraud, so how would to check out help? In today's episode, we invited a panel of industry experts for a live discussion on LinkedIn to conduct an independent review of to check out or very phones capabilities. We covered why payment providers are the hardest to work with among e-commerce technologies. Finally, we discussed how different payment processors differ and why companies will need a payment processor. Such as to check out or very phone, despite their negative reviews and clunky technology. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our e-commerce series, for which we meet every Wednesday at 5:30 p.m. Eastern. We review one technology or the solution related to e-commerce. And for today, we have a very interesting solution. It's called to check out and very fun.、Uh, so we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that. Before we do that, we are going to start with everybody's intros. I am going to start with、uh, my intro. If you don't know me, I am Sam Gupta, your host and principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP, e-commerce and digital transformation consulting firm. On that note, I am going to move to Robert for his intro. I am Robert Brown with. Robert Brown E-Commerce Consultancy,、um, and happy to be here tonight, Sam. Okay, amazing! Thank you so much for being here, Robert. And if you are in the audience and joining for the first time, make sure you guys post your questions and comments. We typically try to cover them during the show. If you run out of time, then we'll make sure that you receive your answers. On that note, I am going to provide quick commentary on this solution, Robert. Then you can provide your experience, any sort of research. That you may have done on these guys. So first thing first, I don't think we have reviewed any of the payment processor so far. So this is probably the first one. Now, when we look at the landscape, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I was like, okay, to check out maybe like super tiny payment processor, but they are really big overall in terms of the market share, and、uh, you know the kind of company that they are owned by with private equity. So there is a lot of play overall with respect to payment processor and、uh, how they drive the e-commerce space. Obviously, the role of payment processor, as far as the e-commerce technology ecosystem goes, there is not much as such, but obviously they play a very important role when you are going to be evaluating, selecting your e-commerce platform, the kind of integrations you are going to get, the kind of issues you are going to get, because anything and everything related to payment and bank. It will give you a headache. I promise. Okay, regardless of the the、uh, processor that you are going to choose, obviously this is probably going to give you the most headache.、Uh, <laughs> but they will give you the headache. So I'm going to pause there, Robert.、Uh, any commentary there on these guys before we start on the slide? No, I don't want to take away the fun for later. <laughs> okay. Um, interesting. Okay, so let's review the slides. So here they are the Florida-based company, 
Uh, and obviously, their primary business model is really the point of sale. So a lot of different terminals is uh, where their play is. A lot of these platforms have come up with their own e-commerce offering. In fact, these guys, to check out in Verifone, they, uh, Verifone, I, I think, bought your to check out. And that's how the reason why they wanted to buy them is because everybody is trying to at least claim that they all have this so uniform, unified commerce capability and they are trying to provide sort of the omni-channel experience at least from the payment perspective okay so omni-channel experience is going to differ but even when you talk about the payment and loyalty scenario sometimes that could have a little omni-channel layer there as well so you need to keep that in mind but that is not going to be your comprehensive omni-channel experience when you look at the overarching uh, omni-channel experience when it comes to e-commerce. But here we are talking about just the payment loyalty POS is what this solution is for. The industries that they are targeting, they are in very retail-centric industries. So financial is one just because there's a lot of cash volume happening in the financial industry. Talk about banks, retail, hospitality, hotels, obviously have a lot of, uh, you know, credit card swiping there. That's why they are there. Petroleum, very interesting. And I don't know what petroleum means. Maybe this is probably the convenience industry. That's what they would be at. I don't know if they are going to do anything in the oil and gas industries. Government, obviously, you have a lot of cash transaction there and healthcare hospitals. Any comments, Robert, by any chance on the industries? So if they're in um, the energy sector, it's probably actually customers just paying for the energy. So if you think about, I live out in rural New Jersey, so my heating source is actually propane. And so I actually have to pay uh, my propane provider online. So it, that could be how it's... Yeah, I completely used. agree. Yeah, that could be one possibility. And yes, I have seen two checkout with a lot of different vendors, even the newer ones. My understanding is that I remember, I think I pay Yesware using two checkout. So Yesware is fairly, fairly modern technology and if they are using it obviously um, either their rates are really low that could be one incentive why companies no. would like to no no. Uh -uh. no they're more expensive than stripe interesting okay because i mean we need to see the reviews i guess in in reviews somewhere it was mentioned and maybe i'm mixing things so okay so so you are sure robert that they are expensive right yeah okay perfect okay interesting very interesting and the technology is very clunky as well so the reason why companies would like to move to them is because they are secure, Robert, or why are they working with these guys? Then? So the only reason that I can figure out that they're using this is because they go places that Stripe does not, or exactly. they allow payments to places that Stripe does not. So for example, I have a developer in Pakistan. Yeah. The only way that I can pay my developer is through Western Union, which is kind of a, a pain, but that, that's the only way that I can pay him. Because nobody else will send it there. Uh, you need to try Veeam, V-E-E-M. Yeah. yeah, there are some platforms and WISE as well, W-I-S-E. Unless your developer does not accept anything else. If they want just cash, then it's a different deal. <laughs> yeah, but in, in terms of like the, the, the original major players yeah. that most people are used to, most of the major players, they're, they're really wary of some of the third world countries. Quote, what would what, you originally consider third world countries? And so there's an added risk going there. And I think maybe that's what is perceived here. Because I can't see any difference in terms of functionality or features that would, would make that big difference. So here's my take on this. And I don't know if Stripe has the same terminal that you are going to see at Walmart. Heavy foot traffic, grocery transactions is a very different deal in general. Okay. So yep. I cannot see myself swiping my credit card on a Stripe when I'm sending in in in, in Walmart skill, to be yep. honest. Okay, I need something like Verifone, right? So the the original and that's why NCR actually does a lot of business in those spaces. IBM used to do a lot of business in in those spaces, and the only reason why they could do that business, and I have spoken to a lot of retail businesses, and they were looking for an ERP, and I'm like, okay, you want to go for an ERP? What are what is your choice? Well, Robert, see, that's yeah? that's different. So my my wife's business used to have Verifone. <clears throat> exactly. Okay. So, yeah. you know, used to have the card swipe and we found it to be a lot more expensive. And eventually she moved over to Evalon, which was offered through Costco. 
which was significantly cheaper. And then her um, studio management SaaS platform uses Stripe, which was, you know, all, you know, integrated. So we really didn't have a cho choice of using anything else. And so she uses Stripe now. So, you know, Verifone from a, a credit card swipe terminal perspective, yeah. perfectly fine. You know, th th that is a great product for, you know, the, the brick and mortar store, but that's a lot different than the e-commerce checkout functionality. Yes, but now let's talk about the integrated loyalty. Let's talk about integrated payments. So in your case, when you are using a Stripe on your SaaS, in your case, your probably the volume is not as much, probably customers don't care for loyalty or whatever, but you do have fragmented loyalty and payment because you are using two different providers, one for your SaaS, and one for your brick and mortar experience. Actually, now we don't. Our, our SaaS is actually integrated. And so we actually have a card swipe for Stripe locally. In the studio itself, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So for a business like studio, okay. So you are not going to have foot traffic like we care. No, for we're not. Those, no, we do not. For those businesses, Stripe is completely fine. There's no problem at all. Yep. I, I'm, I'm completely, in, in fact, let me see. Restaurants, hospitality, bars. Stripe is completely fine because they don't have as much traffic. The, the whole payment process is very different. And I was speaking to, and let me finish my story. So I was speaking to one guy who actually wanted to try an ERP. And I'm like, okay, which ERP system are you trying? And he's like, my biggest critical success factor is going to be the kind of POS system that I'm going to be using. Okay, that's my bread and butter. Okay, yeah. I don't care for anything else. Okay, if I cannot integrate with my which one was that i guess uh light speed if i remember light okay. speed light light speed right in the microsoft business central ecosystem there's one pos system that is very 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 uh, famous and goes through retail you know heavy foot traffic and these are the let's say ncr terminal very phone terminal as well as um uh, it's not light speed I'm, I'm missing the name of the the pos uh, vendor there uh but they like you have a real category of POS systems designed for grocery, retail, and brick and mortar that are going to be very heavy foot traffic and their transaction is going to be very involved, complex. So that's where I guess my take is in general when I look at Stripe is great. There's no question about that. If you are going to have a business like SaaS or media or a club bar for those businesses, the Stripe is great, but not for the real grocery, grocery business. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if, if we're going to start talking about, you know, the, the brick and mortar uh, foot traffic in a store, then Verifone is, is absolutely a great product. If we're going to be talking about e-commerce payments, which yep. is to check out, that's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. But let's say if you are 95%, of, you know, foot traffic and 5% e-commerce, who cares for e-commerce? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And, and that, that's a fair statement. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here, and that's probably the reason why Francisco Partner, which is a very humongous private equity, and they paid $3.4 billion. Okay, yep. everybody wants to control money. <laughs> Every single private equity. And yes, they are really controlling your POS. They are controlling anywhere, wherever the money is flowing. That's what these guys are trying to control. Whether you talk about Klarna, whether you talk about, uh, you know, any e-commerce, the majority of the e-commerce vendors are so hot is because of the payment, to be honest. It's not their technology. <laughs> so this is a very interesting play. And I don't know what Francisco Partners is trying to do with this, but I believe they have some other uh, solutions in their portfolio. And once you actually get POS, uh, other things become easy. And once you have one solution, then follow on sale is going to be easy with respect to POS as well. So here the company's architecture enables multiple applications, including third party applications such as gift card and loyalty card programs. And loyalty is a big deal in POS space in general. Uh, the NCR terminals, I used to remember, I mean, they were when I used to talk to businesses, they would not go for anything else. Okay, other than your NCR. And the reason for that is because of the loyalty. The retail loyalty is a big deal in general uh, when oh. you have those cards. Uh, yeah, because there's, there's a huge problem when you're actually, you know, physically swiping cards. You have to have a unit that actually can handle the volume. Some of them were, were garbage and would actually fall apart, right? Yeah. Or they wouldn't read and you'd have to swipe them multiple times. How, how often have you seen a cashier actually wrap a card in a plastic bag to try to swipe it so you can complete the transaction? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding, you know, and so that's one of the reasons NCR was like a tank. It could take yeah. anything, 
yeah. take a beating and just keep on taking the swipes. And that's probably the reason why I would say the traditional retail market is crowded by POS systems, to be honest, because uh-huh. they cannot run their businesses without POS. In fact, I mean, they don't even have an ERP system as of today. The reason for that is because all of the POS systems, they created sort of the POS fulfillment layer and they called it OMS. <laughs> And they don't have to worry about all of this ERP systems, to be honest. They don't need it. So it's a very interesting play when you look at the pure play retail. So these guys, uh, they are saying that healthcare insurance eligibility, as well as time and attendance tracking, uh, they have that as well, which is very interesting. So they are playing in the insurance vertical just because there could be a lot of cash movement there as well. Yeah, the biggest value prop, they have already mentioned that it's because it's happening in the same system. They don't have to move to the next system. Um, and that's their biggest value add. Do I have anything else here? No. I have some more taxi media. Taxi also uses it. I've seen it. Taxi is a big deal. Taxi payments. Okay. That must be like substantial yes. amount of transactions, right? In tourism and, and travel. Right. So if, if we if we back out and if we go straight to the e-commerce piece, just, just as a comparison, you know, talking about volumes and size, According to Built With, to checkout has 3,900 sites live. Yeah, and this is not meant to be, and I don't know how true that is, to be honest. So, okay, so, and the reason for that is because to checkout is typically going to be after your, once you actually hit your, what is that, the payment button, then your flow is going to be, and we are going to check that uh, in the slides as well. So, I don't know how good the Built With is going to be in tracking the JavaScript library through which they are trying to track how many sites they have on this platform. I don't know how they do their crawling. I mean, that's certainly something that we can look at over the Christmas break to figure out, you know, how reliable <laughs> this information is. Probably not, but you know, it's something we, we could talk about doing. Whereas they say Stripe has 1.1 million sites. Yeah, but I mean, I can almost guarantee that they are looking at the JavaScript library. They are looking at the name, uh, you know, typically you are gonna have some sort of code uh, that is going to be common across e-commerce platform. They typically try to crawl that. So in this particular case, since to checkout is going to be behind everything, in fact, you are probably routing it to a URL. And I don't know whether that URL is going to have some sort of to checkout word in that. Um, so again, I'm simply, this is just a hypothesis, uh, yeah. but that could be a possibility. 3,900 sounds very low for to checkout in my mind. It, it does sound low. Um, I looked at the sites listed and none of them stood out as anything notable yeah and again they are not meant to be e-commerce portal they are meant to be more of the payment processor so their role is going to be far deeper in general in the stack so here now if you look at their portal their portal is very similar like an e-commerce platform and now this could be very confusing for people who are looking at the e-commerce stack for the first time so they have similar to your cPanel. Here you are going to get order customers integration. Looks very similar to your e-commerce portal. In fact, they have marketing tools. <laughs> I don't know what they are doing there. Uh, they have affiliate network, but this is all from the perspective of to check out because what they are trying to do is they are trying to create everything that is going to benefit them from the marketing perspective, from the promotion perspective. And that's why you sort of have the affiliate network there. That's in my mind, Robert, correct me if I'm off here. Uh, that is going to be the trusted sites that have that you have probably trusted on this platform that you are doing transactions with. That's what affiliate network would mean inside a payment processor, right? So yes, in, in this case, but they not knowing how they're using the term affiliate, because it could also mean that it could be referrals and they're actually paying back affiliate commissions. That could be a possibility as well. You are right. You are right. But I mean, at the end of the day, what they are trying to do from this platform is they are trying to give you the PNL of whatever is happening with respect to payment so that you can number one track the payments number two, you can reconcile those payments. That's what is happening. So when you say accounting, accounting is really related to the transactions related to them. So they have opened up a portal for you to be able to track your transactions. It's not supposed to be your e-commerce. So every vendor that you are going to be working with, whether you are working with a 3PL payment processor or some sort of EDI interaction, in every case, you are going to have these portals where you can do the reconciliation of your transactions. That's the intent of this portal. Okay, so the affiliates is the affiliate 
model working with. So they say, get in front of new customers worldwide via our niche affiliates across the globe and use our channel manager solutions to multiply your global distribution network online. Okay, so from the payment perspective, how would that work? Do you want to explain a little bit more? Sure. So if I make a sale and you're part of the affiliate network, you have guaranteed that you will pay back some of your revenue for that sale to your affiliate. So yeah. typically it's going to be like 10%. And so what I'm assuming to check out does is they strip off that 10% of the transaction and send it to the referring affiliate. Interesting. Yep. I, uh, yeah, I think that's how the whole payment distribution model is structured uh, because obviously they have very nested relationships uh, in that space in general, the way their sales commissions are shared, the way they operate. So I, I agree with you there. And I bet that they're probably double dipping on the fees as well, because they're probably taking a fee from the original seller and a fee from the affiliate. Interesting. I'm not sure if that is possible because obviously they have to comply with a lot of different regulations as well. They are part of the financial entity. So, <laughs> Well, uh, see, there's nothing wrong with them charging a transfer fee. That's right as well. Yeah, that's a very interesting comment. It's a very interesting comment. Okay, so moving along here. So they have a lot of different, let me see, when you look at the workflow in terms of how you are going to activate your account. So here, uh, I think some of the concerns that some of the users have reported is that you can have only one domain. If you have two domains, then you know they'll not allow. Uh, even if those two domains are going to be part of the same company and brand, you cannot have as part of the same account, so you probably need to have a different account. But here, when you say product information, they are trying to uh, include this product information as part of the, uh, when you are going to do the checkout, after that, the product information is going to be there on the checkout screen, so for that, they are requiring some sort of URL, refund fo policy, as well as delivery policy. That's the setup that you are doing when you are setting up uh, the activation. But I have read some of the reviews that they take a lot of time just to activate the account. So just be careful with that. Um, you know, it might take some, 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 some time. Now, this is how the payment processor integration is going to look inside your Shopify. So they are going to appear as part of your credit card, which is very interesting in general because you are choosing them as the credit card. But once you, so it's almost like uh, it feels very repetitive in terms of the flow. So first you need to select the credit card as, as part of the credit card. You need to select the two checkout. And then after that, you come to your two checkout portal inside that you need to see the same information again. So again, it looks very repetitive in general. The experience that they are providing is not the best. I would think that probably Stripe is going to do a better job uh, here. It could be because of the kind of technology that they have. Uh, it's very clunky in general. Yes, I would agree. More comments, Robert? Well, so, you know, one of the things that, you know, e-commerce, there, there's been a lot of articles in the last month or so talking about um how profitable e-commerce really is. And there's far too many uh, executives that are sticking to the mantra of, we're going to make profits off of volume. So they're, they're looking more at the top line, not the bottom line. Yeah. And so they're not really looking at the profit. They're just looking at the total revenue. And when you are in that kind of model, you don't want to die by a death of a thousand cuts because yeah. everybody has their hand out. Everybody wants to take a little slice of the action, right? That, that is one of the big things I have against Amazon uh, is how much they take from all the sales. So if we look at, say, Stripe, Stripe starts at 2.9% of the transaction plus 30 cents per fee. The larger your volume, the lower you can negotiate that down, right? Yeah. With to checkout, the lowest they have is 3.5% plus 35 cents per transaction. Yeah. They add what they consider great features to encourage you to um, give up a larger percentage of the sale. So they have what they call the most popular, the subscribe version, which is 4.5% and 45 cents per transaction, or the monetize, which is 6% plus 60 cents per transaction. That starts to add up yeah. with volume. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's suddenly, if you're not paying attention when you start advertising, 
and you're not paying attention to your average cost of sale, yep. you can be underwater real quick. I completely agree. In fact, I, I don't think some of the other platforms, when I look at their pricing, they don't understand why some of these e-commerce platforms are pricing the way they are pricing. In fact, I mean, they are trying to follow the e-commerce platforms as well. For example, you take an example of uh, companies like Channel Advisor or similar companies, they are all going to say, you know what, I only take like 0.05% of e-commerce transactions. Okay, <laughs> if you look at the <laughs> annual fee, <laughs> bam. Oh my goodness, it could be expensive, uh, you know? And that is what everybody is trying to do. So these newer e-commerce technology companies, they don't necessarily understand how to price their product. Um, to be honest, I mean, that's my biggest complaint with most e-commerce uh, technologies out there. When you are part of the payment processing workflow, that's a different ball game, okay? You are, that's the cost of doing financial transaction because, you know, financial business is very different. They have to comply with a lot of different regulations. Yep. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a different business. It's a very, very, very difficult business in general, okay? Uh, but now these newer technology companies are saying, you know what, I'm going to do the same. <laughs> but your cost structure is not the same. You need to understand that. So you cannot be competitive there. So yeah, um, I don't know if you have any any other follow up commentary there, Robert. No, I I agree with you completely. I think most of the people that have SaaS platforms do do not really understand the landscape well enough, or they do and don't care what's ending up with their end customer. Exactly, exactly. Could not agree more. Great points. Okay. So here is their flow, and this is my problem with this, okay? So here you are going to get an option for credit card uh, on a checkout page. So in a way, you are sort of selecting the credit card, but here you are not selecting the credit card, okay? You are selecting two checkouts, so which is kind of confusing. From the customer experience perspective, customer journey perspective, now you hit the complete order. After you are going to hit the complete order, it almost feels as if you are going to get the checkout page again. So let's review what do we have on the next page, okay? So on the next page as well, what do you have? You have the review card, shipping information, billing information. And the only reason why you have this is because, you know, you are doing a little data exchange between your, uh, your e-commerce platform and the payment uh, platform. And that's how they are getting this data. But this is actually powered by your two checkout. So obviously you are going to get their clunky UI. And now they need their UI to be able to finish the transaction. So again, from the user's perspective, this is horrible. This is a nightmare. But I don't know if any other payment providers are have come up with better ways of facilitating the transaction. My understanding is going to be, if I remember, Stripe has far slicker and a smoother transaction, right? Yep. You know, yeah. basically, you know, the, the guidelines from all the credit cards is the credit card data is not allowed to touch the website unless and and the guidelines are extremely strict if the credit card data goes through the website servers the website yeah. servers actually have to be in secure location they have to be secured away from other servers they actually have to have secured <laughs> access right so they actually you know the credit card like visa will actually go take a look at the servers to make sure that they actually have locked doors and that limited access is provided to them that the data that even if it just flows through the server, it has to be hashed and encrypted. It's very strict. And I looked at having to do this with AIG for a year and a half, and the technology teams just could not wrap their heads around the security necessary for it. And yeah. so we stayed with Chase, and Chase gave it all to us in, in iFrame. So the Chase payment portal, which, which is <laughs> so far behind... Uh, providers like Stripe, they yeah. only gave you two options. They gave you an API or they gave you an iframe. And the technology teams at the time, this is going back um, probably like six years, didn't have the wherewithal to do the API integration because they didn't have the experience. And so they stayed with the iframe, which was pretty clunky. Um, but that way it ensured that we met all the regulations and then it went directly to the Chase servers, which were in a secure location. And so we didn't have to touch it. So we weren't on the hook. Yeah, that's very interesting. I guess that could be the reason because obviously uh, to check out and very phone, they are known for their security, I guess. Yep. Uh, you know, that's probably the reason why you are feeling that they are really hard to work with. 
Uh, now, obviously, the newer startups, they are able to get away with these things. I don't know whether they are able to get away or they are complying. Uh, they have better technology. Uh, my understanding is going to be, Robert, if I do a little walk through here of the flow. So let's say instead of iframe, let's say you have a dev. And, you know, typically, let's say that's going to be a HTML code that you can embed in your dev, right? So in that, let's say that HTML uh, code is directly going to call the API right from the browser. I don't know if the server is being hit there. So even if your div code is going to be embedded as part of the page, not sure if the server is being hit. So nope. I don't know why these guys, yeah, that's what. So I don't know why these guys are not able to do the same. It's actually split, right? So the page is rendered from your own server. Exactly. But, but the the embedded code here actually can't even go through your server. It, it can't even tunnel through it. It actually has to go separately as a separate call to their servers. And, exactly. if, you're, and if you're caught with that transaction going through your servers and you don't meet the guidelines, you can be fined up to $50,000 per transaction and banned from their network permanently. I understand. But I mean, let's say if you are simply calling an external API right from the browser, you know, using a div, I don't think there is a problem. Well, it depends on where the XML resides, right? Uh, HTML. Uh, and it also depends. On, so if you're calling HTML, right? So there, there's the, you're calling the, the HTML for your own page. But within that page, it's like a servlet. And that servlet does not go through your server. It's actually rendered from their servers. So in the newer, you know, in the Node.js world, I guess, there is no servlet. So obviously, uh, there are a lot of improvements overall from the technology perspective. So now... Everything is probably in the way Stripe might be doing. They must be doing it from the JavaScript perspective, right? So yep. it must have uh, some sort of, you know, Node.js code that is running inside your web page. So what they must be doing is they must be calling this. And, you know, again, it doesn't need to go to your server. You are not calling your internal API. You Correct. can call an external API. So the only place where the data is going to sit is going to be on your machine where you are performing the transaction, Correct. which is completely MVC. okay. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Right, because it's your property and then you're calling an external API. So again, I guess either it is because of the regulations that these banks are not able to comply. I'll give you one more story, okay? So I don't know how often you deal with business in developing countries, okay? So we have our entity in India as well. And doing business in India right now is crazy, okay? If you have to deal with banks there, they still have three megabytes limit for your email can you believe this i cannot put my signature in my email if i need to correspond to the bank if i need to move a single dollar from the bank i need a one-time password even if i have validated hey buddy i'm trying to send to robert i've sent a thousand times to the same person why the hell do i have to enter otp again <laughs> do you not trust your own code <laughs> I have no idea, you know, whether these guys just want to make your life hell <laughs> or there are real regulations. I just, they just don't make any sense whatsoever. I, 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 I'll be honest with you. I have not had to deal with any businesses or development specifically in India for Indian markets. You know, I, of course, I've had many offshore teams in India developing yeah. for like the U.S. and Europe and meeting their regulations. But that sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I mean, see, this is nothing. If you actually go to Mexico or Brazil, it's probably going to be worse. It's even bigger nightmare because for each transaction, you have to report to the government. And India, the way their GST and VAT is computed, it's still very monthly and uh, quarterly reporting. The way Canada has to be honest. OK, if you go to Mexico, like for every single transaction. You need to talk to the government. It's it's a nightmare. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, that's so awful. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Anyways, uh, enough complaints. So here, now, this is how your, and most likely this is probably going to be beautiful technology called iframe. <laughs> that's what yeah, you check, yeah. <laughs> to check out is using. So obviously, once your workflow is going to be completed, then you are going to get your submit payment and the workflow is going to come back to your website. That's how the process is going to be. So now let's look at some of the reviews. So here they are talking about two to 10 employees and obviously everybody is going to be using payment processor. So it's not the size of the company that matters here. This is a recent review. 
So here the person is saying, I really liked its smooth way for integration with custom developed web website, which could be a great plus, I guess, you know, that's why I was interested in this platform, to be honest, okay? Because if you have a custom developed website and if you're simply looking for card functionality, this could be a great value add. There is not a lot of e-commerce platform that can decouple your card functionality and provide it for your custom website. But in this particular case, I guess that's the reason why a lot of websites might be using to check out for that. And this is the only one, I guess, they are probably going to catch built with, and that's why they have only 300, uh, 3000, I guess, you know, with built with, but not the actual payment processor integration uh, when they are going to be doing with Shopify or any other platforms. And I'll be honest with you, at, at this stage of the game, having a custom built website is a liability because, is. Yeah. because you're probably dependent on the developer. Yeah. And anybody who has dealt with developers, if you get somebody else's code trying to go through and debug whatever they have done, there is probably no commenting on there. There exactly. is probably, you know, they are probably not using best practices and trying exactly. to figure out what happened. It's nobody again, knows. <laughs> it's it's just like whatever they felt like doing to make exactly. to make it work. Exactly. And that's why so many people are moving to towards these main platforms because there's consistency. Yep, I agree. You know, if your developer dies, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> luck exactly 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 could not agree more but there's a case robert i am not sure if you are going to be okay without a custom site always because there are businesses where you might require that so if you are plain vanilla e-commerce you might be okay with these platforms um but let's say if you are slightly different business there are businesses mm -hmm. which are going to have very different workflow uh, I still don't think that, you know, businesses such as your airline, tourism, hotel, uh, sure, there might be some custom platform there uh, as well, but those are very unique businesses uh, in terms of the e-commerce workflow in general. Yes, they are. The way their listings are going to be, it's not, I mean, if you try to fit them in, in Shopify, uh, airline, no, good luck with that. No, no. <laughs> and and that, that's not your standard e-commerce. It's really not, you know, the, the travel and leisure industry, you know, the, the booking functionality of that is, it's all homegrown. Right. But they would require a payment processor. So we are looking at everything right here. It's not just the commerce site. So yes, if you're commerce sites and if you're doing custom I don't know why you would do that, but there, there is a place for custom sites as well. Yeah. So here, by the way, I mean, this these guys are marketing and advertising. I can see in some cases why they would require a custom site. Their workflow could be unique. They might not have a standard product-based websites. Um, that could be the reason why they might have custom. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you simply want to provide a very content-centric website. That's also a possibility that you probably would have custom. I, I would bet that it was probably a very old site and the the architecture and the back end is so old they figure i may have some uh tech debt but i don't want to pay it right now so it's easier for me to just leave the back end and just redo the front end and let me just keep doing that until i'm forced to do something else and for these smaller businesses it just makes complete sense i mean ups still to this day uses cobalt <laughs> exactly exactly you know they've got like two guys in their international finance and accounting department that have been there forever and they keep telling them you know you need to upgrade and get off cobalt because there aren't very many cobalt developers left and they're like no we're, we're, we're fine it's going to get harder and harder to find them <laughs> it's going to be really hard to replace that there are some systems i i, I don't know whether i told you uh saber story or not i think they tried to replace saber for a very very, very very long time multiple attempts were failed just because they could not really process the same transaction volume that saber could do that and the reason for that is because as you move uh, ahead or move up in your technology stack the easier your user experience is going to be the more processing power you are going to need so when you look at the basic uh, your your cobol based technologies they were very lean in fact i'll tell you one more story so i was looking at one business and they were like, okay, they were roughly a $1 billion business, okay? And, and they had decent volume, retail distribution, food and beverage distribution. And I'm like, okay, $1 billion means you probably need to be on SAP, okay? Otherwise, these systems cannot process the transaction. And they had some mainframe-based uh, system from 1960s, and they were doing fine. 
they were able to process all of that transaction in those systems and i was just blown away to be honest okay and the reason why i was blown away is because you know these old technologies can process they have a lot more processing power then the newer ones because your windows you require those ui elements that is probably going to consume a lot more memory as well as processing power and that's the reason why the newer systems ui driven the ones that are going to have user experience they are far harder to scale than the older one i guess i mean that's my theory i don't know robert if you agree with me or not no i agree with you i mean it's it's saber is a really old entity yeah founded by American Airlines and mm -hmm. been bought a couple of times. I think it even spent a little bit of time under the Sendent group before they were forced to break up again. And its technology mm -hmm. is old, but it's embedded so many places. They just can't undo it. Exactly. I, I guess the hotel reservation system is the same thing because, you know, you have, I don't know how many agents are there in the world that are using these systems. So the amount of scale that you really need when you go to your airline, when they are trying to, um, you know, fly you, every single airline, passenger, the tourist agent is trying to touch the same system. That's a lot of scale <laughs> yeah. overall. Um, so that's why, I mean, it just, it blows my mind uh, overall. In fact, I mean, the 3PL business is very involved as well. They are not your plain vanilla, you know, commerce. And that's probably the reason why they are still using mainframe. The same thing goes for banking. If you look at the payment processing workflow, they could be very involved in that. Well. So some more comments here. The powerful fraud protection system. I think they are known for that. Uh, and that's probably the reason why they feel very hard to work with. Okay. Do we have yeah, that, that, is, that is a big deal, fraud protection. You know, there's some third-party sites that have come up that, you know, help protect you, like Braintree is one. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, sometimes the fraud protection systems are great, to be honest, but they could be overkill, right? Oh, it's yeah. like fraud is going to happen once in a lifetime, but you are giving me a headache on a daily basis. <laughs> Some of the crazy stuff I've seen, you know, purchasers try to do with fraud, you know, they, they because they go into the dark web, they buy all those credit cards and they try to recreate it and, and make purchases. And thankfully, there are fraud protection out there to protect some of these smaller retailers. But, you know, the, you'll have these scammers that have these numbers and they'll just ping sites relentlessly trying to purchase product. You know, some of the, some of the folks that I've worked with, they've had up to 100, 150 fraud transactions a day. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, retail e-commerce, you definitely need to be careful of that. Otherwise, you know, it's very hard. Yeah. Um, so here's some more commentary. The website... Uh, that has just one business activity. So if you sell ebooks and courses on your website, you can't use two checkout according to their policy. You should include only one business activity. <laughs> That's crazy. I don't know why you would do that. Maybe there are some international regulations from the payment perspective that whatever, <laughs> but crazy, crazy. I have no idea why you would do that. I I guess it depends on how they're classifying business activities. Exactly. You know, because if I'm an e-commerce retailer or if I'm an e-commerce business, I'm going to try to have as many streams of income as possible, as much diversity as possible. So that could mean that I'm selling physical product. I could be selling digital product. I could be selling subscriptions. <clears throat> now, I don't know if those are each considered a separate activity within the classifications of to checkout or whether they fall within your retailer and that's what you are. So I guess this is done more for the money laundering. And I don't know, uh, Robert, if you recall the any of the international transactions that, that you may have done recently, you need to specify, okay, what is the activity that you are booking your transaction against? Uh, so it has to be, okay, are you paying bills? Is it going to be some sort of payment? So maybe these guys have to utilize that. And I don't know if this money goes internationally somewhere and then comes back. There is a possibility. You never know <laughs> where the money is flowing with your payment processors, right? <laughs> this, this is true. I mean, you know, the laws are pretty stiff for some organizations on know your customer. So the U.S. financial institutions, the know your customer laws are pretty stiff. Yep. And, you know, there's no bending them. And you have in most cases, they actually have training every single year yeah. to make sure that you understand the policies and procedures for you know your yeah, customer. Completely agree. And that's why anything related to payment is really hard. Yep. <laughs> Um, anything related to money is also hard. And that's probably the reason why ERP systems are so hard. Okay, so here reviewed on 2020, they are saying the most painful authorization process with the most ridiculous rules when you write to support 
there can be three or four different people answering in the same thread and it seems you never get an answer and again if you um, the reason why this would happen is because payment industry in general is very complex and i don't know if you're going to get better experience with any other payment processor to be honest but sometimes they all have knowledge about a specific jurisdiction or any particular locality or the regulation and that could be the reason why you might be feeling that four people are answering the same question but in general payment space is very hard it could also be how they have their customer service set up right so it could be there could be a round robin for assignment for an open open ticket and they just keep assigning it to a different person until it gets resolved yeah but i mean there could also be legal obligations to be honest especially in the payment space uh, you're not supposed to be writing anything that you're not supposed to because then it's a real issue mm-hmm. there so there are a lot of things a lot of different variables again payment is hard in general i, they, I just have to say that the negative reviews that i've seen from them is significantly higher than other payment processors i completely agree Yeah, I completely agree Robert. Yeah. And some of these reviews are reasonable to be honest, okay? <laughs> like yeah. if you are doing commerce business and you have to go through this, it's going to be painful. I'm not going to appreciate that. Yeah, there's no way. They go ahead Robert. I I you know, recently it it's becoming more and more difficult. So, I personally have an issue with the new terms of service that PayPal has. So, PayPal has specifically said if you make any comment that they disagree with, they have a right to charge you $2500 for every comment that you make. And there's no arbitration, there's no there's no specificity of what that comment pertains to, who you may be able to escalate that with. <laughs> It's just basically if Crazy. they feel like they don't like your comment, they're going to charge you $2500 and they can continue to do that. And I know a bunch of people that have money that are that's locked up from PayPal because PayPal just decided arbitrarily that they're going to hold on to it. And, you know, this is becoming a huge issue. So, for processors to I know that when COVID hit, my wife's SaaS company tried to do the same thing. So, there are probably 30,000 dance studios around the world that use this particular SaaS platform. When COVID hit and all these studios were expecting to get their first of the month payment because there was auto pay, the processor decided the, the SaaS platform decided you know what we're just going to hold on to it because we're afraid that customers are going to come back and and demand the money back now the SaaS platform is not the service provider of these customers the local dance studio is yeah and so for them to step in and say you know what we're going to hold on to this money there was at least 20 lawyers involved within 12 hours and finally the platform capitulated and said all right fine you know wrong call on our part and they they submitted the money but here's all these studios that are suddenly going to start having checks bounce because the processor decided hey yeah. we're going to hold the money without anything in their guidelines <laughs> and so for a payment processor to do that to you know many of these small and medium sized businesses to just arbitrarily decide hey i'm going to hold your money because i don't like what we're doing that's a problem that that's as big a problem as getting poor customer service yeah could not agree more i think great great story there okay so some more comments here they are saying they put stupid limitations like you have to give them one url from which the purchases uh, will come so what if i have two subdomains and this is the comment that i was talking about mm-hmm. so if you have two subdomains then you are in pro- problem again it doesn't make any sense uh, the way they have structured this i finally finally could not use it because it didn't allow me to withdraw to a us or eu bank account rather it forced me to withdraw to my own country's bank account i yeah sometimes these issues could be because of payment regulations to be honest there could be a possibility but things like two subdomains i just don't get it neither do i yeah Okay some more comments here the admin panel interface needs some work for user experience that is right as well they have the bulk of options and sometimes you feel hard to find such options the fraud detection is great but they charge too much amount if any charge back is received oh wow okay till now i am not able to calculate how their charge backs are counted that's very interesting <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 
so I've, I've, I've read the same reviews uh, on a number of different places talking about, you know, their chargeback and, and how they calculate it. And, and, you know, people aren't happy with that. Exactly. I would not be happy with it. <laughs> um, I want to find out every single cent that I have, I guess. Um, yeah. Anyways, uh, here are some more reviews. Complicated and not mobile friendly coming from 2017, which is not very old. Panel that make the products set up and utilizing other tools difficult, which I would definitely agree with. Difficult to customize shopping carts with the lack of documentation to help build custom store using API. Oh my goodness. I mean, I don't know how you are going to customize the iframe. There might be some options available, but it's still going to appear very clunky. I don't know how much you can really do that. Yeah. Some more comment, 11 to 50 employees, good support, outdated UI. This person is happy with support for some reason. We are using platform for more than two years now and missing the critical feature to allow us passing discount information from our site to the platform without entering it in Evangate cPanel. Okay, so we also were trying to set up subscription for our products, but lost an option. 20, 30 connected with each other features made it possible to set up without a good knowledge of how do they work. Platform developers made it over complicated. Commission rate is five to eight percent. That is quite high. I would agree with that. I think this is where your comment is coming from, Robert, right? Administration UI is old, coded in early 2000 and requires a good product manager to be sorted out. I agree. So here's one from November of this year. Worst payment provider, avoid at any cost after five years of usage with many issues and random failures yep. and updated to the API, remove permanently card types without notification leading to massive loss of payments. Support reply takes two weeks to two months. Forget about asking for about the API or failure, there is no usable answer. API is pathetic, simple code does not work, docs missing, API changes randomly in operations. Date of experience, November 7th, 2022. Which one are you reading? I wanna I'm sure reading I from have... Trustpilot. Oh, you are reading from, I think I had that on these slides as well. Yeah, now I cannot find, I guess. That's okay. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting one. So yeah, the recent reviews are really, really bad. And this is the one that uh, you mentioned that they had used it for, five years and they were happy with it but now they have been locked for how many months locked up it, it says after five years of usage with many issues and failures support reply takes two weeks to two months forget about asking about api api is pathetic i'm just scrolling down the, the trust pilot to check out reviews okay yeah so i think i had that as well uh i don't know yeah i think this is the one right uh august 19 2020 this one no not this one no no i think i think they're just common i think it's just you know you'll find probably some of the same issues across different rating um sites that people are really not happy with the support yeah could not agree more so let's just uh you know take some more comments and we have some comments from the audience as well oh that's new yeah okay so let's cover that and if you have any other comments robert obviously we can cover those as well do you want to read this one robert for the listeners yeah I, so this is from will Hare, i think no i don't see any anything from will i see one from unders oh hold on do you see it on the screen Come okay on. i'm actually going to read oh. this one uh, yeah. to okay to mexico requirement to report every transaction the space is ripe for third-party service providers to manage this like Avalara does for taxes. I wonder if two checkout Stripe will get there before someone else does. That that's a good point. You know, Mexico would be a great place to move to next because you know they're right next to us, and we're we're trying to bring back manufacturing and uh, e-commerce from China to here to prevent some of the problems happening. And I think it would be really great for them to go to Mexico. So Anders, I'll address some uh, this comment based on my understanding of Mexico market and the conversations that I have had. So number one, they have the government agencies and they have created these agencies that are able to accept the XMLs for EDI transactions. So government has provided sort of the interaction, but the it is up to the business owners. They have to still file the invoices. They still have to sort of reconcile each of the transaction. That increases the admin effort. And the other comment that you are mentioning to check out Stripe, whether they'll get there or not. So countries typically regulate, you know, which payment providers can be there in that country, right? So Mexico is not easy overall from the payment processing perspective. There are very specific payment processes in those markets. I don't think 
uh, strife is going to be there. They, they just cannot be there because of the regulations that uh, Mexico has. So it gets very interesting if you are going to be implementing e-commerce from Mexico. Uh, it's very expensive to get into Mexico to do business because of the government regulations. And it's not a simple process. It's actually who you know. Exactly, exactly. And by the way, I mean, that's probably in, in most developing countries, even today. Yep. Uh, it's very, 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 very hard. I mean, for those that are able to pull it off, it can be quite lucrative. But to get there, it it is a pain worse than gallstones. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the e-commerce businesses are able to sell in Mexico. There's no problem there. Okay, so you have companies that are taking care of all of this process for them. They never have to go to Mexico. I know most yep. e-commerce companies, they are easily able to sell to a lot of European markets, to Mexican market. It's just that the whole setup is very painful in general. You just have to go through a lot of pain before it can work for you. Yep, this is true. Any other final comments, Robert? No. All right, guys. So that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. So make sure you guys are going to be here in January because we are not going to be here for next three weeks. This was our last show uh, of this series. So thank you so much for your help and contributions this year. And uh, I'll see you all in the new year. Happy new year all. Happy new year. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Robert Brown, head over to rgbecommerce.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Noemi Kiss, who shares her insights into how the water industry works and how its sales cycle differs from other industries. Also, the interview with Jacqueline Laffer, who shares her insights into the Shopify pause and the challenges associated with international payments. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.